You got your Onefinity in the mail, you managed to get it assembled and up and operational, and even complete that obligatory racetrack test that we all do with our Onefinity. And now you're wondering, where do I go from here? Well, this video is for you. I am going to walk you through the process of getting your first project off the ground with the Onefinity CNC. So stay tuned. Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. As the introduction showed you, today I am going to run you through how to get your Onefinity CNC up and operational for your very first cut. Now this video is intended for new users to the Onefinity or new CNC users, so I'm gonna run through the very basics to get the machine operational, but I think it could be informative to folks who are familiar with CNC, but are just new to the Onefinity. All right, so let's go ahead and get started by first walking through the different components you need to concern yourself with to do that first cut and then walk through the process of getting those set up. So right off the bat, we have the machine itself, the spindle and the gantries, and then the controller, which is over there behind my monitor. The One Infinity is relatively unique in so far as it does have a monitor attached to the controller itself. So you do not need an external computer tethered to your machine to actually do the operations. What you do is you upload the G-code to the controller and then allow the controller to move the machine and do the operations. The monitor itself here is used to control the machine as well as choose which files you want to select for your operations. So right now my machine is off. It is ready to go, however. So what I'm going to do is turn it on, show you the process of getting it up and running initially, and then show you the process for putting G-code into the controller and then kicking off your initial first job. So to turn on your machine, there is a switch in the back of the controller unit. I do have my machine turned on at all times, but I control the power here with this little power unit that I have built for my machine. What allows me to control the controller, the spindle, the shop vac, and then I have a fourth outlet here to control whatever I might want to control in the future. Right now, it is unused. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna turn on my controller by pressing the switch, and you will hear the fans kick in, and you will see the monitor light up. Please make sure you have your monitor turned on before you turn your controller on. This is uh, something that happens frequently to new users where the Raspberry Pi will not recognize the monitor unless it is turned on before the controller is turned on. So it's important that you do that first. Once your machine fully boots up, you will see the screen here that's in front of you. It is asking you to home your machine. Now, I will tell you that I do not immediately home my machine. Instead, what I use is I use my control pad here to actually move the machine closer to the homing location, which is the front left corner of the machine right here. And then that just speeds up the homing process. If the machine were all the way at the back or all the way to the right side, it would take a long time to reach to that homing position. So this just helps me expedite my workflow a little bit. You don't have to do it, but I do intend to do it here. So let's go ahead and engage our controller. Let's move things out of the way and let's slide our machine up to close to the homing position. All right, now that we have our machine close to that front corner, I'm gonna go ahead and click home. What that's gonna do is then uh, cause the Z axis to home, the X axis to home, and then the Y axis to home. Now that your machine is homed and is ready to go, this is the time where you want to actually put your stock where you want it for your milling operation and then zero your machine. So we home our machine once when we set it up and turn it on and then we zero the machine at least once to set up for the initial tool path and then we need to re-zero the z-axis every time we switch a bit. So the key thing here is that you home the very first time you turn the machine on, you zero X, Y, and Z at least once for each new stock, and then you re-zero Z for every new bit that you're using. This is something that can be a little bit confusing to new users, the difference between homing and zero, but after you do it a number of times, you will get used to it and it'll just become second nature. 
There are at least two primary ways of doing the zero process for your material, and I will show you two of them. So let's go ahead and slide the machine back a little bit. I will bring a piece of wood forward to simulate the stock that we're going to cut, and then I will show you the two methods that I use most frequently to zero my machine. I've brought this piece of wood forward to simulate the stock for our operations and our zeroing demonstration here. Now you definitely want to make sure that you add your hold down clamps or whatever mechanism you're using to keep your stock in place at this point because you do not want your stock moving after you set the zero position. So in this example I am not going to hold it down, I'm just going to demonstrate how to do the zeroing operation. So let's get started with the first technique of zeroing and that is using a simple piece of paper with your bit to make sure that you have the proper distances set. Let's bring our machine forward a little bit and adjust our bit for the zeroing operation. You want to remove your dust boot and potentially even move your arms up a little bit if that's something that is in the way of the operation you're doing here. Now for X and Y zeroing, I generally try to use the bit that I am cutting with if it makes sense. In this case, I happen to have a bolt cutting bit in. It would be really hard to zero properly with this bolt cutting bit. So what I will do is I will actually add a V cutter in to do the XY zeroing, then put the bolt cutting bit back in, and then show you how to do the Z zero with the paper mechanism. I just put this in just finger tight. It doesn't have to be super tight to do the zero operation. So let's use our controller to slide our machine over a little bit and then jog it down to close to the top of the workpiece. Now what you want to do is you want to jog your machine to close to the where your origin point is. So in this case I'm going to assume the origin point is in the lower left hand corner of the material. If you happen to have it centered or if your origin is at your waste board then you need to put your bit in that location. Once I get the bit pretty close then I slow the machine down and I narrow in right on where I believe the X and Y position needs to be. Once I have it where I need it to be, then I use line of sight down the side and the uh, other side of the board to make sure that it is as close as it can be to that edge. All right, so X looks pretty good there. Let's check Y. All right, so at this point, Y is a little bit too far this way. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and zero X to make sure we capture that position in case we accidentally move it. So I will hit this little uh, teardrop sort of icon here on the screen that will zero the X out and then I will slide Y over just a little bit. All right, now that Y is pretty good, I will hit the teardrop on the Y and that will set the zero position for Y. Now, next we wanna set the zero position for Z and we're gonna use the paper mechanism for that. So let's go ahead and move the bit up a little bit. Let's slide it into the center. So we move the bit up and we slid it into the center of the material to make sure we get a nice accurate positioning. Now in this situation, because this is your final configuration, you definitely want to uh, tighten your bit down. There's a couple different ways to do this with the Makita. You can use both the wrenches or you can use this little button and a wrench. This button has a tendency to be not so reliable at times, it's actually fairly easy to break the mechanism off inside because it is made out of aluminum so I do recommend using the two wrenches to tighten things down. So to tighten them down you just take the two wrenches and you squeeze them together. To loosen it you take the wrenches and you pull them apart. Now the bit is in place, it's tight, it's time to find the Z position so what we want to do is jog down a little bit, get close, Slow down a little bit, get even closer. Once you are close, I slow to the slowest speed and then I get as close as I can while moving the paper back and forth. And then eventually the paper will grab the bit and it'll stop moving and that's what you want to call zero. So there you go, the paper is now grabbed a little bit. I'm gonna back it up a little bit until the paper starts to move just a little bit and then we're gonna call that zero. All right, that's pretty good. So this is where we'll hit the teardrop and say Z is set to zero. 
You'll notice when I hit Z0 there that the uh, the error on the screen actually went away. That is exactly what we're looking for, even though we may not have selected our uh, actual file yet, but we know where zero is, so it's cleared some of the arrows. Let's go ahead and move the bit up, and then I'll talk about the second mechanisms you can use to zero. The second mechanism, which is the mechanism I actually recommend if you have one, is to use one of these uh, blocks to help you zero. This particular block, you are capable of zeroing both uh, X, Y, and Z. Some of them, you can only do Z zero on them, but they do help and make the process a little bit easier. The way that this one works is you actually stick the block on the corner of your material here, and then you jog the machine over and you run a macro on the machine that touches off on the left side, touches off on the front side, and then that will set your zero for your X distance and for your Y distance. And then what you can do is it'll actually touch off on the top as well, uh, and that will set the Z distance. If you are using this block just to do Z, you do need to turn it upside down so that it touches off to this part of the machine. Uh, if you don't turn it upside down, then you will get the wrong height because you have this extra distance on the bottom. But the macro is fairly easy to use. These come in a different varieties. This is the one I have from my X-Carve, but you can definitely get the one from Onefinity, which is made by the same guy, Charlie, who's really awesome, been supporting the community for a long time. Now that we have the material fixed to the wasteboard, we have the machine homed and zeroed. It's time for us actually to upload our G-code and to exercise our operation. For that, I will head over to the computer. It'll be easier to visualize this screen on the computer. I will show you how to do all that and how you get your first operation going on the Onefinity. All right, here we are in front of the computer. This is the same screen that you can see right over here on the Onefinity. So I wanted to show you how you upload a file and how you configure it for operations for the Onefinity. So what I'm going to start with is a real quick walkthrough of the user interface to get you comfortable with it. I do have a detailed video on the user interface for the Onefinity that goes into all the corners, the deep dark crevices of the user interface. So I will link that above and below if you're interested in that. So real quick on the the screen what we see is on the left hand side here this is the keypad this is what allows you to move the machine in various increments in the center you have a little bit of status information this is where you can see what the exact position of the machine is the state of the different switches as well as the toll path statuses you can also re-zero and home various axes here on the screen as well. And then in this center section, you do have a little bit of status information about where the machine is, some of its settings, whether it's in metric or imperial or likewise. And then you have the buttons over here to control the machine. This is where you play, where you actually execute your G-code. You can stop the execution of the G-code. You can upload new G-code, which we'll get to in just a minute. Download the G-code that you have selected and then delete the G-code that you can have selected. In this kind of bottom section here is a rendering of your G-code. This only works on a computer. It does not work on the Raspberry Pi screen because it does not have enough compute capacity to actually render this. So you can actually minimize this by clicking this little arrow button here and it'll decrease the, the size of this and increase the real estate on the screen. At the very bottom of the screen, what you see here is the actual G-code. This is the extra execution file. Uh, it's informative. It's not very useful for human beings, but it does uh, run through this file as you're executing and it does show you that the machine is operating. Although I do have a tendency to watch my machine while it's actually doing its operation. So I can pretty much use my eyes to make sure it's doing something. So uh, again, like I said, it is informative, but not terribly useful, at least not for me. All right. So now that's the basics of the user interface. I want to just go ahead and focus in on a couple things that are kind of unique to the Onefinity that uh, you probably might not run into with other machines. So right off the bat, you do have a list of G code files that have previously been uploaded. So if you're a new machine, you probably likely only have one and this that is this team Onefinity G code. Uh, that is the actual sign that you got with your machine, which is pretty cool. They give that to you as a default. Um, they do not, however, necessarily tell you the bit size and the feeds and the speeds. So I've never actually tried to execute it. But what is interesting about this rendering is it does allow you to validate the origin of your G code file that you set in your cam operations. So for example, in this specific case, the origin is that lower left hand corner of the stock and the current position of the machine here is this little, um, 
diamond, I guess it is, or I guess triangle. Uh, so the machine is essentially just above the stock, just above where the stock needs to be. Now, one thing that is interesting about the Onefinity, what you see is this outlined white box here is not the size of the stock. Those are the boundary of the machine as it is moving. So I'll give you another example here. Let's go back to the engraving I did for my Labrador Retriever here. We'll just pull this up real quick. All right, so what you can see here is the origin is down here in this corner but the machine only moves all the way up to this side. So the, the size of the stock was actually completely square, but you can see the machine is only moving a partial size of the stock. So how do we upload G-code to the One Infinity controller? Well, that's very easy. You just simply select this folder icon and it is gonna launch this file browser for you. If you're on Windows, it'll look a little bit different. I am on a Mac. And then you go to your project files and then you just select your G-code. For example, I'll go here. I will select the, uh, let's go with the pocket outline here and we will upload that. And so it will upload, it'll render very quickly, and then it'll show you what the uh, actual file looks like. And so this is a good visual indication that you have A, loaded the correct file uh, and that your origin is set properly. If for some reason your origin is in a different location than you think, or if you have zeroed to a different location, you might get some warnings over here under this toolpath area that uh, indicate that your machine is either under or over. And so what that means is that the G code is telling the machine to move to a location that it can't access. So once you zero your machine, if you want to maybe go uh, left, and if it goes left too far, it's not going to be able to go that far. It's going to say that it is under. Um, if it is uh, going uh, too far outside the boundary, then it's going to say that it is over. So this is one area that does trip up new users with the Onefinity. It is relatively unique uh, to the Onefinity. Some of the other machines don't do this check. Now, they did update the software, so it does run this check uh, as you are rendering it here before you click play. Before, it would only render the error once you click played and sometimes even during a cut operation, uh, which was really unfortunate because then you'd already be in the process of doing some work uh, and then it would error out. So at least the error happens now before the actual operation starts and you can try to decipher it and debug exactly what the issue is. Generally, what these errors mean is you have not zeroed properly or you have not zeroed at all. And so the G code is telling the machine to move in a position that is outside the boundaries of the machine relative to the homing sequence. So that is why it is important that you home first and then zero and then select your appropriate G code file. Now that we have the G code loaded to execute the G code, it is very simple. What you need to do is you need to go over to your machine. You need to turn on your router. You need to turn on your dust collection if you are using it. And then you simply just click the play button and the machine will start to move. If you need to pause your machine for some reason, you click the play button again. That'll pause the machine on the current G code line. And then you can click that button again. It'll start right where it left off and can continue with the G code. If you need to stop your machine for some reason in a non-emergency manner, you just select the stop button. Now, if you select the stop button, it will start the G code over again from the beginning. So if you're just looking to pause for some reason, then use that pause button. If you want to stop, then actually hit the stop button and it'll restart. If there is some sort of emergency or something goes completely awry while you're doing your cutting, I do recommend either using the emergency stop button here on the screen or actually hitting it with the palm of your hand on the controller. I have done that in the past. Now, one warning on this, when you hit the emergency stop button, it does kill the power to everything. So you have to start the entire process over in terms of homing and zeroing. Uh, so if it is truly an emergency, just know that you are going to start over. And generally speaking, if it is an emergency, that's probably okay. Two things I would like to note for the user interface. First is when you upload a number of files, this dropdown can get very large and you can have a lot of files in it. So you do have the ability to select a file and click the delete button here. Now, when this pop-up does come up, you do have the option to select that individual file that you have selected or delete all the G code on your machine. You cannot currently select individual files that are not all and are more than one. So that's a little bit of a bummer, uh, but it is a feature that they are working on. 
The next thing that I would like to cover is when you are done with your machine and you're done cutting, it is highly advisable that you shut the machine down in an orderly manner that you do not just kill the power with the power switch. So the way in which you shut the machine down is you simply click the fly out menu here, hit the little power button, and it'll ask you, do you want to shut down or you want to restart? So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and I am going to shut down my machine. Uh, the monitor in the back will say that it'll go to the booting screen or the soon to be disconnected screen um, that you see here on the screen here. And then the machine will shut itself down and it is safe to remove power. So those are two important little notes about the user interface in Onefinity that might be a little bit different than some of the other machines you've used. All right, let's go ahead and wrap this video up. Well, that was the video. I hoped you enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to make and hopefully you found it informative. If you're looking for additional content like this, I would ask you to please consider subscribing, ringing that bell, very important these days. Uh, if you're not already following me on Instagram, please consider doing so. That's where I post pictures of projects like this that become future videos. Once again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for getting this far and don't forget to be inspired. Over on the left hand side of the screen, this is where we have the control pad. It allows us to move the machine in different directions and at different size levels. And I'll get to how you can move the machine manually in any size or any shape. Uh, <clears throat> what the does that mean? <laughs> Here is a rendering of your G code. Now this does not work on the Onefinity screen itself. It will only work on a computer. The Raspberry Pi does not have an appropriate amount of 